We're ready? You're ready. Okay, good. Good evening, commissioners and council member Ku, um, and any members of the public who might be with us. Welcome to Welcome to the um, July 27th meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, Catherine, would you please call the roll? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Here. Chair Cribs? Here. Vice Chair Greenfield? Here. Commissioner Lemaire? Here. Commissioner Moss? Here. Commissioner Rechtal? Here. Six present. Thank you very much. Are there any agenda changes or requests or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, uh, Lam, do you have any um, members of the public who wish to speak? We do not at this time. Okay, we can then move on to the department report. Um, uh, actually, I see uh, a hand now. Yeah. You see a hand? A uh, hand just went up. Well, thank you very much because I don't see a hand. So you're gonna have to help me with this again. Lam? Yes, Chair, we just had a, a hand um, raised. It's uh, uh, our first speaker then for oral communication will be Mikhail Salon. And Mikhail, if you uh, would introduce yourself and then you have two minutes and I'll uh, give you access here in a second here. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can, please proceed. Hi, um, my name is Michal Shalon and I'm the uh, president of Palo Alto Dog Owners Association. Um, I've been appearing at these uh, commission meetings for a few months now and uh, I really appreciate the time that uh, you allow me here. Um, in, in between the last meeting and this meeting, I was trying to track down some um, statistics on dog ownership in Palo Alto mainly because I, I didn't know really where else to turn. So um, it was difficult to get the information that I wanted, but what I did come up with was that in 2019 um, and 2020 combined, there were uh, 3.1K of uh, dog owner um, licenses re either renewed or, um, or new ones. And I would assume that most of them are new um, because probably uh, the renewals only happen every three years. So maybe a third of those would be um, uh, not new puppies. And I think there were a lot of pandemic puppies. So in two years, we had 3.1K. It averages out to be 1K a year. And I'm sure that's an underestimate. Um, because many people just don't register their pets right away. And uh, during the pandemic, people probably just didn't get around to it as well. Um, in Palo Alto, there's only about three and a half dog parks. And I say a half because I don't really count Greer as a full dog park. So I really think that this population uh, and their pets are underserved. Um, I think that Parks and Rec have worked really hard uh, on, pilot, on trying to get a pilot program for off-leash showers at Ramos. Um, and it's very difficult to um, anticipate what will happen um, with neighbors. Um, but I had hoped that a pilot program rather than a dedicated dog park would help us uh, ease into a situation that that neighbors just anticipate as problematic, but their fears are most likely unfounded. Okay, I'm done, but we'll never know if we never get the chance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhail. And Chair, that is the only speaker. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. And thank you um, for coming to talk about the dog parks. I appreciate that too. Um, Darren, would you provide the department report, please? Thank you, Chair. Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. The city's been working on a demographic survey for boards and commission members as part of the citywide race and equity work. City Manager's Office sent out a reminder request to the commissioners to fill out this demographic survey. And uh, it's a survey link, Survey Monkey. If you could please fill that out, the uh, Manager's Office would sure appreciate it. 
An update on the skate park progress. Uh, we've been working the ad hoc and staff had a really productive meeting with Sam Kaplinski, who's um, spearheading the effort amongst many other stakeholders. Um, we had a really productive meeting. We're working on adding to that stakeholder team and we have a meeting set to discuss potential location on August 3rd. So hopefully we'll, we'll have, make some progress on that one and be able to come back to the commission, perhaps at our August meeting with an update and um, a discussion. The vice mayor had reached out to the city manager's office and, and consequently to staff to, uh, with the direction to look into prohibiting campfires and barbecues at Foothills Nature Preserve. Staff uh, is checking with other agencies to learn what other policies these agencies, both Santa Clara County, San Mateo County State Parks, and a few other nearby agencies are doing in those regards. We also have a fire staff, uh, fire department staff person joining one of our open space rangers for a fuel assessment of foothills, which will include an assessment of the campground, fire rings, and the, the barbecue areas. Um, and I'll be sure to update the PRC with next steps as we learn more about that. The commission was an email uh, invitation to a wildfire preparedness community meeting. This is going to be held on Thursday, August 19th, 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Palo Alto Golf and Country Club. Um, and there is a link to sign up for, um, for that event. An update on summer camps. I mentioned in last month's meeting, there are about 160 in-person camps and 37 virtual camps being offered this summer. And the recreation staff asked me to share that we're still taking registrations for summer classes since there's still two more weeks left uh, in our summer camp schedule. And I, they shared with me also some nice parent and participant comments that I thought might be of interest to the commission of the community. Um, one comment read, amazing experience for young kids just learning how to cook. They were so proud of their creations and the whole family looked forward to each day's creation. Bravo. Second comment on that uh, was, I just wanted to let you know how amazing my son found Lego camps this summer. They're a fantastic complement to the sports camps you also offer. Um, another one was, what a great way to get to know your community. Thank you for providing for this service. I look forward to signing up for future events and activities. And my kids have loved their tennis lessons. I'm so happy this is convenient and affordable in a positive environment. Uh, Chair had asked me to look into swim lessons with a little update on the latest numbers. Uh, team, uh, let's see, the, the aquatics team provided me. So they're still doing the swim lessons through camps. And then they provide me with a three-year update. So in July, 2019, there was 960 lessons. And then July, 2020, there had been 400, significant drop off related to COVID. And then in July, 2021, we've had 1,070. And so during each swim lesson, each camper is given a lesson per day over the course of a two week camp. Uh, he, they also explain that the swim lesson is the main draw of the camp. A uh, little update on Highway 101 Bridge, not too much more from where we last left off. Expected to be completed August or September, and they're still working on railing, fencing, and lighting. And then the next step I know is coming soon because my staff's associated with it is the landscape and irrigation on the landings on both sides. Coverly reopened uh, the facility for indoor rentals last week. The regular rental season for returning organizations begins September and some organizations are delaying their start due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. Uh, Recreation held fall field brokering meeting last week. Um, rec staff is working on inputting additional requests for the fall season. Fall season runs from um, August 9th through the end of the calendar year. Uh, for special events, Recreation has three events in the works. There's a movie night planned tentatively for Friday, um, September 11th, Mitchell Park at 6.30, the Moonlight Run on Friday, uh, September 17th, and an event called the Jacko Jaunt on Friday, uh, October 29th. And Chair, that concludes the department report. Wow, that's a lot, Darren. Um, could I ask the commissioners if anybody has any questions and then I just have a few. Any questions, commissioners, Jeff? Oh yes, a couple quick questions. Darren, could you just repeat again how many Camps are uh, both the in person and uh, uh, virtual? Yes, 160 in person camps, 
37 virtual. That's great. That's awesome. And, and any idea how many people were reaching with all this? Yeah, I've got a couple stats. They're broken down into little groupings. Uh, so for special interest summer camps, that's cooking, coding, Lego, uh, magic, and academic camps. There were 331 participants. For tennis adults and youth, youth soccer, cardio dance, and Tai Chi, 372. For drop-in boost fitness, 545. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, on the Highway 101 bridge, will a ribbon cutting be planned for this? Or are we, is a society not once again open to ribbon cutting type <laughs> events? Or? I have yet to hear that discussed, but I'm imagining there will be. Great, thank you. Anything else, Jeff? That's all, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lemaire. Uh, just one quick question in terms of um, you know, if we were still in, in a tier, our tier would have changed in terms of our color tier for COVID. What we just will follow Santa Clara County guidance, or do we have any uh, local guidance that, that would um, we would look at instead in terms of summer camps and, and with the, the kids, especially those under 12 uh, who aren't vaccinated? Yeah, great question. We'll definitely be following Santa Clara County's guidance. However, the one exception that the city has just implemented is for inside all city facilities, regardless of vaccination status. And this applies to public and city staff is you, you must be masked. But other than that, we'd be following uh, county guidance. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, I have just a few. Um, Darren, were there any reported cases of COVID during the camps? I haven't yet heard any cases of camp COVID exposures. Great, and have, we, have you had trouble getting camp counselors? There's a lot of stuff in the news about uh, camps inability to uh, find counselors. Have we been okay with that? Uh, I, I've only heard a little, so I don't have the direct scoop from recreation on that, but I did inquire at one point just to see how it was going, and they said they still had openings, but I don't think it hindered their ability to offer the, the offer. classes. Okay, good. And then the final um, question is about swimming. Um, when the kids are finished with the camps that are focused on swimming, is there any way to know what the ability of the kids to swim is? Are they considered water safe when they come out of the camp? Or does, does um, Tim Sheeper rate that at all? You know, I didn't get that information. I'm glad to follow up with him um, and share that at the next meeting or uh, set up a time for you and I to chat with Tim. And yeah, I'm just really interested, obviously, in how many kids are really learning to swim and, and are really drown proof or water safe. So how would, how would that question best be phrased to him? Just water safety rating or how would you, how would you, how should I phrase well, it? I'm happy to talk to him with you about okay. it. So, cause it's a little, it's a little complicated, you know, it's comfortable in the water. It's a, the ability to swim a certain amount of um, uh, meters or yards, like across the pool to dive in and do certain things. Um, and then to do a technique called drown proofing that was used a lot in, in the wars that allows you to just bob in the water without panicking until some help can come for you. So there's a different, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, but it's all really important, obviously. So anyhow, we can do that offline. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much for that report. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I have one question about Foothills Park uh, annual passes. Are we still selling the lot or has that petered out? Uh, we still are selling them. I don't know the current rate, but they are still selling. Um, and I'm glad to provide an update at our next meeting on total numbers. And, and do you know how many people of those passes, how many are locals, how many are from Palo Alto and how many are other cities? I don't have that data right now. I'm glad to okay. look at that though. Okay, when convenient, that'd be nice to know. Sure. Okay, Eva, I apologize. You. I didn't see your hand. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad. No worries. I can spoke up. Um, Commissioner Ku, do you have any questions? No, good? thank you. Yes, I'm okay. good. Great. So um, let's go to the business um, of the evening. And we don't have any minutes because we will have them next month um, for everybody's information. 
Um, let's talk about the ad hoc and liaison updates, um, a discussion, and I think probably in the interest of time, we should just go through and if anybody has anything to add to the sheet that was filled out, um, please add it and I'll start with the Baylands Tide, Tidegate Committee, ad hoc. Jeff or Keith, do you want to answer anything? <laughs> I'll let Jeff have the privilege. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Rectal. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Keith and I met with Valley Water staff and Darren for an hour and a half yesterday, uh, talking about a, a change to the project uh, that, that the commission just uh, recommended a PIO for uh, last month. And I, maybe Darren, you could just give a, a brief overview of what the change is, please. Gladly, by sure. Sure. Uh, so last week, Valley Water reached out to staff and informed us they were going to make a change to a part of the Tidegate project. They plan on omitting the levee trail improvements. You may recall they discussed that in, in our discussion on the PIO. They had planned on adding eight inches of rock and some trail fabric to help the levee hold up the heavy vehicles associated with the project and the construction process. For a number of reasons, permitting, feasibility, and timing, they chose to omit those trail improvements and instead will add trail repairs to the contractor's responsibilities. They, they'll allocate a certain amount of money so that the contractor at the end of every construction season will restore the trail to as good or better condition um, and then at the end of the project would do the same to make sure that the city is left whole in terms of having an as good or better um, pathway on that levy. Uh, so the end result is that the con it shifts the burden from doing it ahead of time to after and the contractor has the responsibility to fix any damage. Um, so this means that they would be required to update their park improvement ordinance and bring this back to the Parks and Recreation Commission. We're gonna target that for August um, and our, I think our meeting was constructive in, in that regard, that they understand this is important and that we want to be forthright and honest with our community and our commissions and our council when this eventually goes to them. So they're, they're telling a clear and, um, and realistic picture of what the community can expect over this four year project. Thank you, Darren. I, I think from, if I can speak for, for Keith as well from the position from the standpoint of the ad hoc, the, the change to the plan is not insignificant and it's, it happened right after uh, the commission made a PIO recommendation. And while we appreciate the information that Valley Water shared with us for full transparency for both the commission and the community, it seems appropriate to have uh, Valley Water return to the commission uh, to uh, re reconsider and, and recommend the, the park improvement ordinance. Anything you'd like to add, Keith? No, I thought it was a constructive meeting, uh, but it'll be nice to get an update. Well, thank you both for that. And Darren, thank you for the update as well. Um, the CIP review for um, 21, anything to add from the ad hoc committee? David, anything? I'm trying to get off mute. Um, we, we mentioned last month that uh, we really don't have uh, anything to do until late in the year when we're talking about next year's, starting the budget process for next year, that what we've got so far this year is pretty much set in stone. And so we have not met. Okay, that's great. We'll just note that and put it in the, put it in the chart. Um, dog parks and, and restrooms, um, Commissioner Brown, anything further? Um, no, we've just been meeting and discussing options, um, you and I together. Um, and if you want to add any specifics or. No, I, I think, I mean, we heard from um, the head of the Dog Owners Association earlier in the meeting today. And I think we're working with, we're working with staff to set up a, a meeting with the community. Darren, anything else to add? No, I don't have anything, Chair. Okay, um, moving on to fund development. We're gonna hear about that in a little while with uh, Jack Morton and Roger Smith. And so we'll leave that report um, as it is for now. 
Um, new recreational opportunities, I think that speaks for itself. Um, that had a great meeting out at the Baylands at the 10.5 10 acres and some really good discussion. And then as Darren said, we had a, a really good meeting with the skaters and the staff around the skate park and moving that forward. Uh, racket court policy. Nothing to report. We have an upcoming meeting that we'll be talking about. Okay, great. And we finally sorted out that Mandy was on that committee on that ad hoc too, right? You and yes. I went through that. I, I think we weren't sure. We couldn't remember. I couldn't find my notes. We thought you were a, you thought we, you were an ad hoc of one. Um, and then the sidewalk vendor policy. How's that going? Uh, I guess I could start and let uh, um, Vice Chair and uh, Commissioner Brown. Um, add we met um uh la this past week um after the deadline um and uh had and we were waiting for uh darren to get feedback back from the attorney's office and he finally got some and then got some more and uh the bottom line is that they're they really want uh, us to make sure that any changes to the rules are backed up with either uh, one of the, one or more of of three different reasons. One is safety and health and safety and welfare. One is the ensuring the public uh, use and enjoyment of natural resources and recreational opportunities without being uh, blocked. And then the last one is uh, necessary to prevent an undue concentration of commercial activity that interferes with the natural character of the park. And this is not that easy. And we had maybe a dozen different rules that we needed to go through to uh, see how to explain um, the rule and why it was important. So this is an ongoing thing. We're gonna meet again uh, next month and uh, it will take us a little while to get through this. Um, and and we were, it was also reported that really there isn't that much uh, demand by vendors right this minute. So um, it's not like there's a, an extreme sense of urgency uh, like we thought. Um, so we're taking our time and doing this thoroughly. Uh, anything else? You want to add, um, Jeff or Mandy? Okay, that's good. I, I, I would just add real, real briefly, part of the, the determining the level of urgency is consideration of uh, the work that we're putting on staff. And if it's not something that's that, that there's a high demand for immediately, we want to be respectful of uh, trying to just spread out the work with with staff right now. Good, that's great, Jeff. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on to the liaisons. We've already covered aquatics and some updates about a lens 10.5. Community gardens, Commissioner Brown? Nothing working uh, with Catherine on touring the gardens. So just ah, working on some scheduling issues. Very nice. <laughs> and then um, Cubberly, Commissioner Moss, any updates on Cubberly at this point and how we're proceeding? Uh, no, none. No? No. Has, th has there been a meeting set up again between council members and the school district? Was that going to happen in the summertime? No, there is no scheduled for the summer. Okay. Council member Koo, any more information about that? We're all kind of interested in Cubberly and what's going on with it. Um, well, council and the uh, school board members have been meeting. It's an ad hoc committee, but we haven't met recently since we went on break. Um, so we're, it's still on hold until we return. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, field users, I see quite a bit about field users. So uh, vice chair. There's, there's a lot in there and, and there's, there's a pretty big problem, frankly, at, at the uh, synthetic turf fields. 
uh, at Mayfield and El Camino Park with the uh, infill material globbing and melting into kind of globs. And uh, yeah. this is something that we tried to address uh, at El Camino Park about a year, year and a half ago or more. And uh, the solution at that point we thought was I, I as I understood, was re replacing all, all of the, the material that was not properly rated for our geography. Uh, basically, <clears throat> it gets it gets too hot here for the material, so it does melt, which is what we're seeing. Um, did do you have apparently the same? not apparently not all that material was was replaced, and now so what's happening at El Camino Park is is some of that same material original material that wasn't replaced is now the problem that we're, we're seeing the problem with, and the same infill material was used at Mayfield, although the the uh, refurb was done a, uh, afterwards, and now we're seeing the problem, and it's it's uh, pretty significant. Darren, please feel free to add anything uh, if you like. Yeah, thanks, Vice Chair. It is very frustrating. Um, we're working and we have a meeting tomorrow with the, the vendor of that infill to try to resolve it, and we'll do our best to get it done in a timely process and hopefully better than the El Camino project was done. Just to explain that a little further, when they when they swapped out the infill at El Camino, there's a certain amount that is sort of embedded in the lower portion of the turf that's hard to get out. Um, maybe impossible without lifting up the carpet, I'm not quite sure, but we're gonna to try to find a better way when they look at Mayfield and, and get that one fixed. So we will do our best. Um is there also a problem with the new, much newer Coverly uh, turf uh, field? No. Okay, so that one was done in a different way. Yeah, I think it was just this infield company made a mistake and spec the wrong um, type for our, our uh, temperature zone. Okay. And co co Coverly was done after we experienced the problem at El Camino. So I, I, oh. I know we were sure to make sure Sure, sure, sure to but not Coverly, the same problematic material. Coverly was done at least two or so yeah. years ago. So we've known about this for a while. Is, um, it, the same, is it the same vendor, um, Darren, for all three fields or just the two? Yeah, it's a, a different vendor uh, for the Coverly one. Same Thank for you. yeah Mayfield and El Camino. And what is the new signage for Coverly uh, about? Uh, largely it's focused on rules to protect the track and field. Okay, yeah, we, we were having some problems with, uh, with the uh, gym uh, people throwing medicine balls and uh, there was a javelin thrower and things like that that are not good for that field. So. We did have a little talk with them. So I hope that uh, we don't have that issue at other fields as well. The, the rules haven't been updated since the track was changed from the uh, decomposed granite to the synthetic material. That, that, that's part of the reason for the update. Yeah. The and other, also just, and just to tighten them up. The other one is uh, dogs uh, on the field. Dogs are okay on the track, uh, although uh, not off leash. And uh, but dogs on the field are re are requested to go somewhere else. That will be that will be reflected properly in the new signage. Great. Uh, okay. There's one other. There's one other, and that is making sure that people uh, take their trash with them, because we've had issues, especially before COVID, with uh, games being played and trash being left behind by both teams and and uh, or, and uh, audience. Okay, thank you. Um, Goff, uh, Commissioner Lemaire. Uh, nothing at this time. Thank you. Um, um, wait, I have a question about golf and that is the there was some question about the um, the kids camp uh, golf camp and that area closest to Arastadero, uh, I'm sorry, Embarcadero, has that been moved, uh, has that moved forward at all? Not quite sure which one you're referring to, Commissioner Moss, but we've got the first tee that works with the kids. Okay. And 
is is that what you're asking about? The the triangle between Embarcadero and the um, uh, the driving range. Yeah, that so that's a big part of what First T has proposed. And uh, you know they want to partner with the city to make some improvements there to make that much better and more usable, which includes fencing and some other improvements. So we're still in the discussion phase and looking for the possibility of, of meeting with council um, in a closed session to discuss. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the Hawthorne area planning, uh, com Vice Chair. Uh, thank you for the appointment. It's quiet right now. Uh, I've been in contact and I've signed up for status and waiting to get rolling on that. Good, and then the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation, Jack will talk about that in a little bit, but just to commend the foundation for the uh, music series uh, through the month of June, which was funded in part by foundation uh, funds. Um, PAUSD, Keith, you said earlier there was nothing going on, so anything yeah. to add? Nothing to add. The, okay. Those meetings are tabled for the summer. Thank you. Safe routes to school, Jeff? No update. And Safe Board Park, Jeff? Uh, nothing beyond what uh, Darren had reported. Thank you. Um, I'll just go quickly through the last of sustainability, um, Commissioner Brown. Yes, I did talk with Christine um, just to check in. There will be some um, announcements and engagement opportunities on the sustainability and climate action plan coming up in the fall. So um, I'll just keep apprised of that and either Darren or myself or both will share any information. Great, thank you so much. I'm glad to see that, that's good. Um, urban forestry, either uh, vice chair or Keith? I'll, I'll have something for you next month. Okay. Ventura plan, Commissioner Recto. Yeah, nothing new to add. Uh, I'll work with the chair to get a, a draft of the letter for next month. Oh, great. Thank you. We were going to do that. Um, and then the youth council is not meeting this summer. So that's it um, for our, our report. So thank you very much. I know sometimes it feels tedious to go through that, but I really appreciate knowing what um, committees are doing and liaisons are doing. So um, thank you. I, I appreciate your attention to all of that. Um, oh, Lydia has her hand up. I couldn't see it. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Ku, I mean, Council Member Ku. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, how substantial is the cha is this changes to the work for the Baylands tie gates? I mean, is it substantial enough for it to return to Parks and Rec for consideration, or um, how substantial is it the changes? Yeah. Thanks, Council Member Ku. To the project itself, in terms of fixing the tide gate, it's not. It's really about access for heavy equipment and ensuring that they don't damage, or if they did, they repair the, the levee trail that they need to get to it from. But given that this is such a popular trail and that there are significant closures associated with this, um, and I guess there are even potentials for well, at least we have concerns. The ad hoc and staff have spoken to the Valley Water staff to say, we want some assurances that this change you're making isn't gonna put us, push us into higher risk for delaying the project or higher risk from impacting wildlife more than we would have normally. And by that, just to explain very briefly, if the contractor is now responsible for those after the fact trail improvements, are they gonna be rushed and have to have, for example, true drilling rigs at one time when they might have only had one before. Does that noise impact wildlife in a way that we hadn't predicted? The Valley Water staff understands that those are concerns of ours and intend to have answers on those kind of questions when they come back to us at our August meeting. So I think it is important enough to warrant a new park improvement ordinance that makes this very clear exactly what they're doing and an opportunity for the community and the commission to provide some input before it comes to council for review. That's great. Um, so it will come back in August too. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, now the levy itself, is there any compromise to the levy? Because 
that's where all the heavy equipment is going to be, right? Do I understand that correctly? That is. So when I say trail and levee, they're synonymous in this regard because people are using the biking and, and walking on top of that levee. And that's the worry. Most of it is bay mud. It's um, built long ago and it will rut up pretty easily in the winter. And some of the work will have to take place in there. So you know rutting is going to happen. It's really about being able to repair it. And I think we're really looking at do it, doing it proactively, which is what they had originally proposed, versus doing it retroactively, causing the damage and then fixing it. And I'll let Valley Water explain the nuances as to why. Um, it's a little complicated and multifaceted in terms of the why. So I'll, I'll let them explain it when they come back. They could do so better than I can. And, and the Darren, levy, I'm sorry, um, the go levy ahead. is not going to be compromised uh, in terms of flooding, right? No, it'll actually be better than it was in terms of flooding, at least in the area near the flood the tide gate. So they're not they're not raising any other portions of the levee. It's just the tide gate replacement because the structure is so old and failing. Um, so it doesn't the project doesn't aim to bring the entire um, levee system up to um, like flood protection levels, but it would dramatically improve the area immediately around the, the tide gate itself. Thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. Sure. Um, Darren, also, um, uh, it was mentioned that they were originally going to cover the levee with gravel, which would be difficult for bicycles. So uh, they, we've been talking to them about what kind of thing they're going to use to, to uh, resurface it uh, that bicycles could be could go on uh, other than gravel yeah they've assured us they're going to make uh they'll use what we want basically which will be in kind so in an area where we've got sort of smooth bay mud and it's looks like dirt by and large they will reuse that kind of material or great and sure that we end up what we started with or better i've explained and I've seen multiple iterations of levee repairs in my time at the Baylands. Some very crude, large rock, no fines, horrible for, for bicyclists. And conversely, I've seen class AB or aggregate base rock used where it's perfect. I mean, you could ride a road bike on it and it's like a street. And I, I think we can, um, we can work with Valley Water to make sure our end product is that smooth, appropriate for bicycle and hiker material. But ultimately, they'd be responsible for making it like it is, not making it um, something different or, or much, much better. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, David. OK, moving on to the next um, item on the agenda. I'm very happy to introduce Roger Smith from the Friends of the Park, Palo Alto Parks, and Jack Morton from the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation. Um, I've asked them to provide us with a brief history of their foundations, why they started, how they started, when they started, their activities, and also their priorities for Palo Alto. Um, both of these organizations, as we all know, play a really big role in the operation and success of recreation and parks and open space programs. So after their short presentations, um, commissioners will be able to ask questions and make comments. I thought it was just really important for us to hear from these really important foundations. So I'll ask Roger if you would uh, go first, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ann, and thank you uh, to the commission to let us have a little time here today. In 2003, uh, Judy Kay, my wife and I, decided to form uh, Friends of the Palo Alto Parks with the, uh, the main idea that the city would never have enough money to do all the neat things we needed to do. So we're a small group uh, of eight board members headed up by our president, Susan Beal. And uh, we've done a number of small projects over the years. For instance, the, the Learning Center at Arastadero was one of the things we uh, helped get done. Uh, the, um, we have a fund for the Bold Park uh, Nature Plant uh, Garden. And uh, a new thing we're doing is the Embarcadero Road Polinari, uh, Polinari uh, Corridor Project. And then we have had some major ones. Our first major one was Heritage Park. And uh, 
those of us who's been around a long time can remember when the clinic was there. So, uh, and one of the things that we had hoped over the years that we would get uh, uh, neighbors involved in it. That's a great example of uh, Christine and John Irving who live right next to the park he uh, headed that up. And uh, so that was one of our first uh, projects. Our second major project was Lytton Plaza. And that was headed up by uh, Barbara Gross and Chop Keenan, Keenan and Lee Levy. And Lee made a substantial uh, gift to that. And the fountain there is uh, uh, named after him. And it always warms my heart to go through there and see uh, young people. And uh, I think it's a, it's a great, uh, uh, it, it turned out very well. The third project is our, we're, we're most famous for is the uh, Magical Bridge. And Alinka and her group, uh, she was on our board, really did an outstanding job. Uh, the Dick Perry uh, family made a very large donation to get that done. And Alinka has carried that on to other communities. A fourth thing that we're doing, and, and I think shows our flexibility, we're working with the city to uh, get the, uh, uh, to get the, uh, the new signage out at, at the Baylands, which will be in uh, English and Spanish. And there was a case where we fronted some money because there was other, other funding sources, but there was a gap. And uh, so that's the other thing we do. So we're a very flexible organization. We're open to anyone with a great idea that uh, for a project, we're a 501C, so we can get a uh, fund started and uh, people that donate will have a tax deduction. So we're a small group, our heart's in the right place, and we're happy to, uh, to work with the city and all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roger. Um, do the commissioners have any questions of Roger right now? Okay, good. Um, yes. So, I guess the main one is um, if we can try somehow to um, do something with Foothills um, to bridge the, the, uh, the gap, um, uh, the budget gap there. Uh, considering all of the, uh, the wear and tear that it's had in this past seven or eight months. But we're not there just yet, but um, I'm hoping that we can uh, do something there. Well, we, we would be happy to participate in that and, uh, and uh, would look forward to visiting about that. Thank you, thank you, Roger. That was great. Um, and you have a really nice website that um, I'm sure people look at a lot. Um, I, Darren, I didn't see how to get to the Friends of the Parks website on the new city website. Um, and I think probably I just need some instruction, but I'm assuming that it's, it's there someplace. I'll double check. That whole transition was a little rough and we, I'm not sure we're all the way there yet. So let me, let me take a look with Catherine and we'll see about Okay, uh, we where could, that is, we, yeah, we share can talk about mission. that offline, but I just wanted to make sure that, that the, the Friends of the Palo Alto Parks do such great things, and it, it would be really important, I think, to have them visible on the city's website. I think they used to be. I think so, yes. Yes. Okay, moving on to Jack Morton. Jack? Jack, did we lose you? No, you're on mute. Is that better? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am not technologically as advanced as my 10-year-old grandson, so I'll apologize in, 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 at the beginning. Okay. So how did the REC Foundation start out? Um, I take a deeper look at what goes on in Palo Alto. I immigrated to America in the 70s. And because Mary Ellen had grown up here, uh, we came here with an 18 month old. And why would a Canadian come to America at the time of the Vietnam 
war. And I think that's what framed my view of how commissions, how cities, our city, Palo Alto work. I think in lots of ways were a belated response to problems. And of course, what happens in my perception and in my experience is that when things are going well, we have a rec department, we have staffing for things. The moment the, there's a downturn, the, you, you're gonna lose the only ice skating rink west of the Sierras. You're gonna lose, um, you know, Baylands. I mean, I think if we look at the actual history of what the commission and um, values, you will find that yet we, the community had to fight for Baylands. It was smelly when my in-laws came here. I, I, as long as my in-laws were alive here, they used to tell me that when they came from Kansas, the Baylands was a garbage pit. And eventually the community got tired of it and changed things. So what, what am I trying to say is that organizations like the Friends of the Park, the Friends of the Library, Palo Alto Recreation Foundation sort of evolve because in a sense it becomes unbearable. You're going, something that the community values is gonna be destroyed. You're gonna just, you know, and I really got involved because when I discovered there was an outdoor ice skating rink, um, you know, I, I think Dawson was three. Um, that's a, a probably a year late if you're a Canadian to start learning to skate. But anyways, we, and then one spring when he was eight, year old, eight years old, I said goodbye to the founder. And he said, well, I'm, we won't be here next year because we're going to be torn down for um, condos. I could not believe it. So anyways, we started the Winter Lodge. And that was my problem because Anne thought if I could start the Winter Lodge, maybe we could save the May, Mayfield, you know, the May Day Parade and all of the other things that the, you know, the first reaction of, of a, the budget people is to eliminate people that don't, I'm sorry to put it this low, but we don't pick up garbage or, um, you know, don't fill potholes. So I and a number of people got together and then we tried to figure out how to fund. Now, you have to remember 40 years ago, the bulk of downtown Palo Alto was not $11 million houses. It was vacant houses that were standard, you know, off, off campus housing. So, and it was an economic downturn. One of the things that I think has kept the libraries, the park, you know, the parks and recreation going is that we finally as a community said, this is in, as important to us as all of the other things that the city does and which we depend on. And um, I guess what I, I've learned over time, unfortunately with the Winter Lodge, although we traded up what would be now Baylands, um, we tr traded eight, ten acres there for acres on um, Middlefield be, uh, to, to save the ice skating rink because it was one of the most used facilities for young families, you know. Um, what we hadn't learned, and I guess this is one of the things I'm gonna 
ask you to think about whenever you accept funding and approve fund of, and use funding. We hadn't learned to make it make sure it was permanently dedicated. So, for example, you know, who would have thought in the 90s or in the 80s that you, we'd, we'd ha we might have to fight as a community to save the space in Coverley, which is one of the, it's not a giant open space place, but it is one of the largest open spaces for South Palo Alto. And I mean, I think if it weren't for those of us who care about these kinds of activities, there'd be no pressure on city council. They'd just simply say, well, look, we've got this lot on uh, Middlefield. It's got to be worth something. Let's uh, sell it and, see, and use the money. And then that money just disappears and the community loses a uh, major thing. Now, Roger, uh, being a banker, probably had more sense of where the, I guess, one, the, where the preservation parts of things go. Like, how do we ensure that when we raise money, now I'm not talking, I mean, for a long time, the REC Foundation we put on the black and white ball because we had a community in which that was a, a, a thing that many, let's say, middle-aged families enjoyed. Um, and so we were able to raise enough money to make sure that the May Day Parade continued. We were, we, you know, we funded a number of other things um, that kind of fundraising um, is, uh, in my perception, is sort of no longer possible. What we have to do is look at ways where larger dollar amounts, I mean, we still want to support, you know, the Calab world music events. We want those things because we understand full well <clears throat> that program, adding program things to staff can't do that. There is no way probably for the next four or five, maybe even longer that the city will approve unless it's something absolutely spectacular. But ongoing things are going to have to be funded out of, at their own existing level. Um, We've, uh, we've done World Music Day for probably 10 years, but we used to do it just as one day in June. Um, the Calav people approached us and said, what, do you, what would you think about if we tried to spread it through the month of June? So we did it as an experiment. Um, you know, most of the management of that is all volunteer. Um, because again, we understood staff is stretched and <clears throat> they didn't want another program, particularly a program that occurs on a Saturday and a Sunday. And so would, would require staff. So we have we evolved in that in that respect. But again, also, I I don't know about membership on the commission, but the kind of nonprofits that we have um, historically been have a harder time because uh, we don't have a the luxury of a one parent not having to work, so you don't generally end up with some one partner uh, being able to provide more time for public um, support of public activities. So. Jack, I'm Where gonna, are we? Jack, I'm going to jump in for just a minute here and um, ask you and Roger both. Um, when we talked with Commissioner Brown um, the other day, it seemed like the the most appropriate thing is for the Friends of the Palo Alto Parks 
um, are concerned with um, more, Roger, wouldn't you say more capital kinds of improvements and the Recreation Foundation concerned with supporting programs that community services is running? Does, does that feel like a, a, Roger, does that feel like a definition? No, I, I think that's very close. We, uh, we tend to do that. And, uh, and uh, so I, I think that would be a good way. And, uh, and we, we, we have only done things that are park related. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but, uh, but we, we, we tend not to run things, if you will. So the reason that, that I think that these both, the, both these foundations are really important for Palo Alto is that um, in our master plan, you know, we um, have talked about support for parks. We've also talked about support for facilities. And when we put together, the commission put together our work plan um, in our ad hoc that has to do with um, recreational opportunities, we had identified uh, three or four areas that were really capital projects. Um, one is what we're gonna do with the 10.5 acres. One is the skate park, which council has asked us to look at. Another one is the city, potential city gym. Uh, then the first T and now it sounds like potential athletic field renovations and it felt to me like it was important for all the commissioners to um, understand what potential funding vehicles there were available to us. These are all, both of them are 501c3s, although I think the Recreation Foundation has a different determination, but I'm not sure about that. We, have a, we have a dedicated beneficiary, which is the city. Right. So okay. that so and since it's frequently program money um, that the city is short of, um, we have uh, we're dedicated. So most of our monies go directly to program and to uh, city programs. So yeah, well, that that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I wanted to make sure we get both the designations because obviously what we're going to be looking for, um, assuming that the council approves, obviously, is a place where um, citizens can contribute money to causes that have been um, outlined by the city council and supported by the Recreation Foundation. So I'd like to stop right now and see if commissioners have questions about history of these two foundations, what goals are for the future, how we can all work together, um, and whatever else we want to say. Let me just start with Commissioner Lemaire. Yeah, I want to thank uh, both Roger and Jack for being here. I think it's such an important, um, you know, the service that you guys do is, is really amazing. And, and, you know, just hopefully we're uh, able to engage younger families and keep them abreast of what's happening and, and really get them involved. Uh, I do have a question of Roger, uh, just to, if you could provide maybe a, a very high level overview or a brief description of how a project comes to fruition in terms of your involvement and uh, maybe how you raise the funds or do you go to city council first or did, did, do you find, did you find an idea and then find the people that might finance it? Um, but just maybe a brief overview of whether it's Lytton Plaza or Magical Bridge or Heritage Park. Um, maybe all those were, are very different, but um, I think that might help. Uh, the commission and, and anyone who's able to, to view this? Well, the uh, Heritage Park was a simple one that uh, because it was just raw land at that time. And uh, so through the neighbors and uh, uh, we, that came uh, forward. Uh, Jeff uh, Trom lives in that area and he was on our board. So that one came from, uh, it just made sense. It was, and uh, so uh, we got neighbors involved. The second one really came, uh, Lytton Plaza really came from Roxy Rapp and Lee Levy. And Lee loves water and, you know, former mayor and, and a very, very generous man. And uh, so we got that and, and we put together a little founders group to raise the money. And there's a plaque there of people that unfortunately, and I think this is very important. A lot of our old citizens, if you will, that grew up here, so to speak, are now gone. If you look at that plaque, there's about mm -hmm. six people that are dead and uh, we need to replace them. And the, for, the nice thing about it, there's a lot of tech money around town, but it's not the same. 
and a little harder to get a hold of. So that's the way that one came. Alinka came to us. She was on our board, joined our board because she had the idea of uh, Magical Bridge. And, and she, she, she is just outstanding and obviously, uh, and so a little bit of where we come from is like Henry Kaiser, find a need and fill it. And so uh, that's where we came. And then uh, the, uh, the Baylands, uh, where I think we have some flexibility is working with the city. And, and, uh, and we've done a several things where we needed a organization that could step in between, in that case, funders. And we funded some money until the money came through. And uh, so that's the way. Uh, so we, we tend to be project oriented. And uh, so people come to us. And one of the things we have, and uh, uh, I think I've talked a little bit about this. One of, the, one of my dreams was that we would have, every park would have their own rangers, you know, Greer Park or whatever. And one of the things I wanna just throw out to the commission is as we go get ready to redo a park, I would encourage, and I would be personally happy to start with a thousand bucks to form a, uh, a fund for that park because there's activity and then we can ask people to contribute and it would be a nice thing. And once people write a check, they're gonna have more interest in the park next door than they were. So totally flexible. Uh, uh, does that help, Jeff? Yes, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I know Roger, we've talked about that several times and I think it's something that we'd love to help um, move forward and get support for that because um, we're gonna be listening to um, some information about um, Bulware Park in a little while. And um, I would suspect that it would be nice to have a, a small fund to support Bulware Park um, if it comes to that. Any uh, other comments uh, maybe from Commissioner Brown? I got to ask all my questions in advance. So I got, I got lucky. Um, uh, I guess just sort of a logistical question is, when you're trying to recruit new volunteers, either to serve on the board or to get involved in the foundations, um, have, what are some, some ways in which the city or the commission could be helpful to you in that way? Thank you. That would be a great one, I think, for Jack. Jack, thoughts? Um, what's, I guess what's important to us is continuity and trying to find, as you already, as Ann mentioned, or Roger mentioned, families near the activity that will sort of police it after we're through with the fundraising. I think I have more of a bias now that when fun, outside funds are raised, they get permanently dedicated. So I'll take the fountain, for example, that the city cannot, uh, let's say, without a vote of the community, just go in and decide it doesn't want a fountain there anymore. Or if we, you know, I mean, um, things like Coverly sort of and the struggle and the, 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 with the school board over whether or not that remains community accessible. I think when we start raising outside money, the offset, and this is where the commission has to come in, um, we didn't do this with the Winter Lodge. We traded city land for um, very um, expensive at the time, um, now impossibly expensive money for the Winter Lodge. But in those cases, what, when we get the community involved, their efforts should be somehow, I don't know, it should not be that the next budget puts the activity or the uh, investment, the, the capital investment at risk. So I think one of the things we outside funders, like with libraries, there's not quite that risk. With the, uh, you know, with the children's theater, there's probably not that risk. There would be such an uproar. But that's not necessarily the case when you, something like, you know, um, the, the, uh, the old Palo Alto Medical Building, that becomes revitalized as the History Museum. 
we have to make sure that the city can't someday decide that it just doesn't want us that building to be supported. Anyways, these are these are just 40 years of frustration with a with government on my on my behalf. It's not you commissioners are the warm side of governor government, but you get to the you know to the uh, so all, all I want to say is when we do these big projects, basically we ha we have to give them longevity. We have to guarantee their continuance. Um, yes, the magical bridge in twenty years might need some modifications. We may change how handicapped people uh, have access to stuff. Uh, a, a, Ice rink in may may change how how often how long we can be open because of global warming you know that sort of thing but the facility that we save we have to guarantee that it will continue to be saved so anyways and Jack if Jack if you don't mind I'll just jump in uh, uh, Jeff to your your question what we found and, and I believe this from business uh, is you need a champion or a pair of champions to uh, take on any of these projects. And then from that, you uh, help out, but uh, it really needs a, uh, a dedicated, I, I view it sort of like a startup. I mean, it's uh, you really need somebody who's willing to really bust their buns to get it done, so. Well, Roger, I, I would say that you're absolutely right in that. And I think we have a great example of the Junior Museum now that it's done and complete with a vision early on and a champion and somebody to really, really create the vision in the community. So you're absolutely right. Any of these big major projects definitely need a champion or two, uh, like the Magical Bridge. And they have been absolutely remarkable. We're running to the end of our allotted time. So I'd like to wrap this up. And uh, David, I'll get your question in a minute. And anybody else who has their hand up, but I just wanted to be mindful of the time. So go ahead, Commissioner Moss. Um, this is, a, uh, in my mind, a very important conversation to have. And, and that's why we have a, a, um, an ad hoc for it. The, the big question I have is we take so much of this for granted, like the, the Mayfet parade and the, the moonlight run and, the, and now we have and the, uh, now we have the Halloween event, uh, uh, which I'd never heard of before, and the world music and the, uh, the movie nights, and also we used to have the music in the park. All of these things um, require, as you said, a champion and some funding. And uh, we, we just cannot uh, take them for granted. And then the second thing is that uh, you talked about how hard it is to get um, people on the board and to, to get people to step up. But I, th I wonder if there's some way to do advertising at the Daily Post, the Palo Alto Weekly, the Enjoy Catalog, because you need this, this new blood. This, you need a lot of small donors or medium-sized donors rather than a few very wealthy families to, to buy in to the community. And unless you advertise or get the word out, it's only going to be friends of friends. And that's not, as you said, it, it's not sustainable because they, they get old and they, they die off. And so how do you repl re replace that? And so if there's some way that we could, that both organizations could advertise to, uh, with a list of projects in an, in an ad and, and, uh, and get their name out, um, and also in our enjoy catalog and other things, I think that really has to has to happen. And I, I don't know how else to do it. Um, well, David, uh, let me respond. All of those programs you mentioned, music in the park, those were all rec foundation programs. We started them all. We got them set up. Mm -hmm. We and then you know what happens? The city rec you know, they can't 
they can't run the music in the park. They don't have the staff. They don't have, and you know, we that we've moved on to another uh, project. So I don't know how you solve that problem. I mean, the well, you know, Jackson, that's I, the hard. That's the hard problem. I think though that the fact that that we can identify the fact that we might want to move forward doing some more either advertising or. Uh, visibility in some way can help us. And we certainly in our funding opportunities and recreational opportunities will put this, you know, put this on the list. That was kind of the, the function of bringing you and Roger here so that the commission could hear about what you've done, what your concerns are for the future. And there certainly are a lot um, and um, kind of learn from the collective experience. So Keith, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, yeah, I agree with David. We have just scratched the surface when it comes to fundraising. Every time someone registers on the Enjoy website, they should pop up a box and say, can you donate some money to either the Rec Foundation or the Friends of Alto Parks? And, and we, could, we could run something like, uh, think of us in your will. I mean, that, that, that is worth, I think, uh, you know, Roger pointed out that, you know, the people that did supported all the things we loved um, are getting to that age. So think of us, you know. Yeah, my, my parents are seniors and they're doing that right now. They're getting the list of the charities they like and they're putting them down in the will. Yeah. And the other thing about seniors is, you know, they've, <laughs> their house is full of stuff. They don't need any more objects. They go for the walk in the, in the morning in the park. That's the best uh, birthday present is to give a donation to the park foundation. That'd be much better than buying them anything else. They'd appreciate it much more. It doesn't fill up the landfill. There's so many good reasons to do it. And we haven't pushed that. And we have uh, 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 the whole park entrance. Each every uh, sign should have a little sign saying, help support this park, donate to the Rec Foundation. Because there's a lot of people, if you went door to door and asked people in Palo Alto, what do you know about the friends of Palo Alto Parks? Or what do you know about the Rec Foundation? I'd say maybe 10 or 20% of the people know about it. The uh, bulk of population 5%. does not. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. That, I, I, just to jump in, also, I think a lot of these folks have never been to a city council meeting. I mean, uh, they're not that. And so we might want to think, and Lydia is so good at this, uh, just maybe uh, having uh, some hero awards or something that we bring out people of various ages that, uh, and just say, thanks for, for doing this, because uh, uh, to be really blunt, a lot of city council stuff is negative and, uh, and there's so much positive stuff here. And uh, so we might want to think about that, but it is a problem. And, uh, and uh, there is a lot of money. It's, a, there's a joke in the, in the, uh, that all, you know, uh, in the venture capital community, the venture capitalists have deep pockets but short arms. So, <laughs> so that's what we have here. We have a lot of money. We got to extend the arms. And that's our problem, exactly. You know? And thank you. That, I know we're, we're running over time. So that thank was you. very good. I just would like to ask the vice chair if he has any comments to close, and then I'd like to make a couple of remarks. Yeah, yeah real, real quickly. Th th thank you, Roger and Jack, for everything that you do and your organizations do. This partnership is, is really important for the city and as Commissioner Brown suggested, you know, we want to help foster this relationship so you can be successful helping our community. Uh, I, I think, as Roger pointed out, champions are really key. It's almost a, a cart before the egg, cart before the horse uh, kind of thing. You need, you need a, a champion and a project together for it to work. And I think, uh, you know, really what we're talking about is trying to figure out how to simplify the process for the community to contribute back to the community. You know, this is really important. And also, improving the outreach and the awareness uh, to, to further simplify the process. And, and we're, we're all on board to, to try and help support uh, those goals. So thank you. Hey, well, and, and if I might just jump in, Katie Ledecky just won the 1500 uh, meter uh, race. <laughs> great. So oh my goodness, that's good news. I buy quite a thing, so that, that's great. That, that is great news. I'm glad to hear that. Well, um, I think Jeff said it very, very well, and I appreciate all the comments of the commissioners. Um, we'll take a lot of these notes back to our, our uh, ad hoc committees and see if we can uh, put together some plans to implement that won't uh, cause too much um, 
uh, too many challenges for the staff, which is already stretched, um, Darren. So um, don't worry about that. And then I think we'd like to have you both come back um, in December and sort of we'll show you what we've been able to do and uh, make sure that we're all communicating because I think we all have um, everybody's best interests in mind and we're certainly a fun group. I mean, there is no much more fun thing to work on than recreation and open space and parks and uh, stuff for kids. And so um, that's what our mission is and we're really grateful to have people um, like the Friends of the Parks and the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation and all that you have done over the years. So thank you very much for being here um, with us. We really appreciate it. And thank you commissioners for your thoughtful comments. I, I appreciate that personally. Um, okay. So yeah, this is Lam. We do have a hand raised from uh, council member Koo. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I see no hands. I think I would have to turn in my computer or my Zoom thing uh, to get a, a new program that has hands. Commissioner Koo. Thank you. And thank you to Mr. Doe for noticing my hand. I just wanted to mention also um, thank you to both our organizations for all that you do to this uh, for the city care uh, a lot of it is carrying on the history and the traditions of the city so um, you know thank you on behalf of the council and the city of Palo Alto I also wanted to mention that the mayor uh, mayor Du Bois for this year has also um, implemented having nonprofits come and do a 10 to 15 minute presentation uh, prior to council meetings. So if you make a, um, if, if you're able to connect with staff and put yourself on the calendar, perhaps you could do a presentation so that not only um, the city becomes aware, but also council members become more aware and uh, place more emphasis and importance uh, and support towards both organizations. Thank you, Council Member Koo. That's really good to know that. Very, very good. Thank you so much. Okay, Darren, I will turn this back to you now uh, for the Park Improvement Ordinance for Bowell Park. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I believe, is here as well. Yeah, thank you, Cher. This is Peter Jensen, the city's landscape architect, who's going to lead this conversation and has been working both with the community and staff and uh, the, the commission on this one for a while. So thank you, Peter. Great. Thank you, Darren. Hey, uh, good evening, commission. Peter Jensen. All right. Excuse me, Darren. I'm going to recuse myself for this whole item. So um, I'll let me know when I should rejoin. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank I'll you. Share my screen here. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Yep. Uh, I'll start over again. I'm uh, Peter Jensen, landscape architect for the city of Palo Alto. Uh, tonight we'll be uh, uh, presenting the park improvement ordinance for uh, Bulware Park. Uh, this has been a project that we've been working on for a full, full, uh, few years now um, uh, with the addition of the adjacent lot next door, the AT&T property. Uh, the project, of course, has uh, expanded itself into a, a, a larger park project, so it has taken a little bit longer to do. Uh, where we're at right now is the park improvement ordinance, which we'll get to. Uh, basically, what we're asking for this evening is the, uh, for some reason, I can't control this thing. Here we go. Uh, the commission to a, uh, a recommend to council approval of the park improvement ordinance. Uh, this is the, uh, basically the next step in this process is uh, approving the design and the scope of the work. Uh, staff will be working on developing some drawings and then, of course, uh, building the park, which we hope will happen uh, next summer. Uh, just to give everyone a uh, review, uh, if you uh, haven't seen this project before, uh, we have Bulware Park property currently now in the green below and the Birch Street property, uh, which was purchased uh, about two years ago. Uh, the plan is to now form these into basically one Bulware Park. Um, I'm not going to go over too much. Uh, the commission, of course, can ask questions of the community process and kind of the, the presentations and everything we did, the outreach that has gone on for the last few years. Uh, we do have a project webpage. Uh, it can be accessed here at the uh, cityofpaloalto.org uh, forward slash Bulware Park. It has kind of the project summary, uh, all of the presentations that were viewed by the community and the uh, Parks and Rec Commission, uh, as well as the community survey uh, that we did uh, to uh, uh, extract information from the community and how we developed the plan. 
the proposed park design, which I will show you in a second. Uh, I just want to bring up some highlights of, of what was placed into the park itself. Uh, we did combine the playgrounds. That is something that uh, uh, the design process favored is having one playground instead of two. Uh, for the Ventura uh, community neighborhood uh, plan, uh, we did uh, set back all the real development from in the park away from the uh, uh, Matadero Creek there, uh, 65 feet. So if there was any future uh, renovations of the creek bed itself, that there was nothing in the way of allowing that to happen. Uh, that was seamless in the park and really didn't impact any of the park amenities at all. Uh, we did include uh, existing amenities that are in the park now. There's basketball, there's open turf areas, there's the two playgrounds, of course, the picnic space and the walking paths. Those elements are uh, still part of the overall park design. Uh, and then we're uh, with the new land and just adding some more amenities to the park itself, uh, which we heard uh, from the community uh, as well as the Parks Commission uh, and also taking some lead from the Parks Master Plan. Uh, we are adding a restroom, a, a dog park to the park, uh, covered picnic areas, a bocce ball area, rain gardens, uh, expanded picnic areas with game tables and expanded loop pathways. Uh, we're also expanding some of the street parking along Lambert and a, uh, uh, providing the park with the accessible parking uh, stalls that it needs. Uh, and of course, there is a pump station in the park and that will remain as it is. Um, so this is the plan that uh, we looked last time at. I think that meeting was in January of this year. Uh, the only real difference of this plan is that we had two restrooms in the previous plan. This one just basically has the one that's located closer to the playground area. Uh, all the amenities that we discussed before and reviewed uh, are the same. Uh, this was also shared with the community before it actually was shared with the Parks Commission last time. Uh, they were in support of the overall design uh, and uh, all the amenities that are in the design itself. Um, the other aspect of the design that is uh, unique to the project, beside it being really a, a starting over of parkland, which we actually don't do in Palo Alto too much. We don't uh, acquire parkland very much and we're built out. So it's hard to uh, have a project where you are expanding park space. But in this case, uh, we are lucky in that sense. Uh, we are going to uh, remove a portion of Ash Street uh, that basically uh, divides the new property that was purchased, which is up in this area, and the existing park, uh, that, so we can combine them all into one area, making Chestnut a, a, a cul-de-sac basically with a drop-off uh, in that space. So that is another unique aspect of this uh, project that uh, uh, will be done as well. Uh, I'm going to hold right here because the image is up. Does anyone have any further questions about the design itself? Uh, before I get into the actual park improvement ordinance. Peter, how big is the dog park area? The dog park area is 0.25 of an acre. Oh, I see. Yeah, I so it's, it. Thank you. you know, I think that we always, when we started to look at dog park areas, we try to get up to the half acre size, I think is what we would like to look at as far mm -hmm. as the size goes. Um, in developing this park, uh, we decided to make it a little bit smaller just because the park itself isn't a very large park. The park itself is also not a, uh, it's a community park uh, and not a regional park. So it's it's got a smaller user group, mostly just the community that's around there. Uh, but uh, I know that we're always trying to find spaces for dog parks. That was definitely something that came with the parks master plan and we discuss it all the time. So um, we did our best to get a dog space area in basically the park boundary itself. Thank you. I have a question about Ash Street. Uh, are there utilities under there that we have to deal with? Uh, no, there aren't actually. There are, there's a drainage line that is there that we're actually going to uh, uh, start to use in our uh, infiltration planter at this point here. Uh, but there are no uh, utilities that uh, run uh, under Ash Street, except for drainage, which uh, is just connected to the park and is draining the park. So we are looking in that sense that we don't have to deal with uh, a gas line or something in there. And has the council already given us permission to do this or is, will this be part of the PIO? 
that is part of the uh, PIOs included is the uh, uh, removal of the of Ash Street to incorporate the full area into a park. Okay, and to Jack Morton's question, <laughs> will this become dedicated parkland, what used to be Ash? Uh, that is something that uh, staff is discuss uh, discussing, and I think that uh, the council will probably have some direction on that. It's not at this time uh, something that is being actively worked on, but uh, we can still develop that area as parkland, but uh, the question of making it parkland is still being discussed, and I'm sure we'll be discussed more with the commission. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I guess I, I have one more question. Sure. That back corner, which is the bottom part right now, that right. that currently is kind of blinded. And so uh, we have issues with people hanging out back there. Uh, will this give us better visibility or will it be about the same as what we have today? Uh, I think it will give us better visibility from the cul-de-sac, especially at this location. Um, we are going to take away the amenities that are back there. Currently now there are picnic tables that exist back there that do uh, provide the location for people to sit and, and in the park all day long, basically. So we are going to move those amenities out of that corner. Uh, We're not planning on really placing anything that's back there. It does back up to a residential. Uh, we do want to keep it open uh, and kind of a, a, a deter that gathering that's happening there right now. Uh, the pathway that is close to there is also meant uh, for people to be moving and walking through that area all the time. So it's not just a static space. Uh, that'll also help with the, uh, keeping that area open. I hear a lot of complaints about homeless people in Bulwer Park. Uh, have we done anything to make this less attractive? Well, I think definitely opening up that end of the park and uh, moving the amenities out closer towards Basie Lambert Street will help out. Uh, I think that the other thing that has uh, come up in the past is the uh, people living in RVs or campers along Ash Street right there because that lot was undeveloped for so long. And I think that was mainly the main issue that the neighborhood had. So by removing that segment of the street, that will definitely impact, I think, that happening as well. And will this parking be two-hour parking? Who decides that? Is that a park issue or is that the, a, a different part of the city that decides the parking? Uh, that's a discussion that we will have with transportation. Um, I'm not imagining right now that it will be, but uh, that may be something that they decide to make it. Uh, mostly our goal was to meet the ADA requirement of uh, providing the uh, necessary stalls that we have to have two at least for the park there. Uh, it gives us a couple more parking stalls, not very many, but uh, uh, we will have further discussion with transportation about what they feel is the parking along that street should be. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move to the park improvement ordinance. So yeah. uh, unfortunately it looks something like this, <laughs> which this is the exact ordinance. <laughs> It does go through the full basic scope of work uh, in a little bit different order than a, uh, what I covered before, but it basically is-, is One second, metal. Peter, I think, I think Jeff has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff, go for it. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, is, there anything, um, is there anything that will stop basketballs from going into the dog park? What, what's the height of the fences there? Uh, there are fences around the basketball court at each end that are uh, right now six feet on the street side and eight feet on the dog park side. So um, hopefully in that corner that that will stop that. That's the other reason that the dog park entry is located there is because it kind of gives you another layer of protection against uh Hopefully, if something does fly over the fence, it flies into the little pin area there, and not out to the fence. So, um, yes. yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what uh, fence height would be needed there, but that, I think that's the consideration that we we want to avoid. Yes. The other thing that we are planning on doing is there as well is you can start to see along the back side of this is there is an existing kind of old hedge that's planted there. Uh, we are going to leave some of that because it does kind of screen the property next door. 
Uh, in this area to get the basketball court, we're actually going to come back with a much more tighter hedge. I would imagine that to be growing, uh, you know, 15 to 20 to 25 feet over its lifetime. So there will be a much more significant wall eventually behind it. So, so what is currently circling around the dog park and the and the basketball and the right side of the basketball park? Uh, this is currently existing is a, a plant that's called privet that um you know it's no no i'm sorry not not the plants itself but the the white space oh the this is the actual lot of the at&t property that they still have with their switching station back here so this edge over here is actually parking lot area uh so even if it does fly over the fence it does just go into their mostly their parking lot space yeah, it's, it, I, I couldn't remember. It's, it's just not clear from looking at that, 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 that obviously we don't want that to be a private residence that the dog park's backing up onto. Yeah. Right. Are they going to use that res, uh, that that land that they're using now forever? Uh, that's a question that I don't think we've uh, really asked them about. It seems that I think that switching station uh, the building itself is fairly important. It doesn't have a lot of people, I think, working in it. But, um, you know, they do own this little frontage that's out there, too. That would be nice to, <laughs> to yeah. develop as well. That's just basically, you know, a few existing pine trees and a lot of pine needles. So uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's been no discussion about that with them at all. So I can't really say. I thought that was part of the original purchase. Yeah, no, that actually is a, uh, for some reason, that's how that lot is broken up, that it has that frontage there. That's actually the lot line. So, wow. unfortunately, because I, so we'll, I think in our original plans, we did have it as part of the dog park, but it was not meant to be. Thanks. Will Ash Street terminate in a turnaround circle similar to what we see for Chestnut? Uh, well, Ash Street is actually is a segment of the street that's basically in through here. And I don't know if you can see my mouse moving. So really, Ash Street kind of started where this, where Chestnut and on this corner here. So it went from Chestnut and then it turned to Ash. So we're really eliminating that portion of Ash altogether. It has no turnaround. Basically, Lambert will come straight by it. You won't be able to turn off of it into the park anymore. And Chestnut will have its... It's basically own cul-de-sac. Okay, so Ash will just go into Lambert. It, it's just, it's just yeah. not clear. It's, it's, you can't see that from this, this drawing so well. Okay, so and then we have all the new parking on Ash Street. Uh, it, the new parking is actually on Lambert. On Lambert, sorry. Okay. Yeah, if, if that if that could all be made more made more clear in the in the diagram, that that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, and so uh, the discussion on whether or not the area that is no longer street should become dedicated as parkland, I'm really curious why we wouldn't be dedicating this as parkland. Uh, I can not really answer that question at this time. That's my, uh, not in my purview really to, I don't know why we're not yet. <laughs> that, so that, that, that seems discussed, like us, but I'm not quite sure what the, uh, uh, what the pros and cons are for at this time. Thanks, Peter. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I, I think it's a, a, a fairly obvious uh, action for the commission to pursue in terms of uh, working to get that land dedicated as, as park. What, what would be more appropriate to dedicate as parkland than something that's serving as part of a park? I think that there is some discussion that maintaining it as a street provides you flexibility with doing things there that if you dedicated as parkland would be very difficult to do. So if one day that development of Fry's wanted to come over there a little bit more, it would be, there would be some flexibility in that, but that's. So, you, so you're, su sorry, so you're suggesting that the plan that we're seeing today might not be the plan sometime down the road. The potential exists that the this new addition could get ripped out and we could go back to having a street there. If we, if we, uh, if I we, mean, if I can't really, I can't tell you what could happen in the future. I know that we did put the 65 foot setback against the creek there, which would allow for development and restoration of the creek. Uh, 
I'm just making the statement that maintaining the road right away there allows you flexibility for future development just because of the nature of what's happening with the discussion of the Fry's location and those things. So, okay, but again, thanks. That, that, that only increases my, uh, uh, my uh, interest in getting this land dedicated as park. <laughs> uh, 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 fi finally, can, can you just talk us through what the, what the process is uh, after after we uh, uh, recommend the PIO that goes to City Council, and then yeah. what what is the process for finalizing the details for the plan and uh, implementing things? Uh, so the. Um, if the commission tonight uh, uh, recommends to council to adopt the PIO, we will be taking uh, the uh, park improvement ordinance to council uh, in the fall, I imagine either late September or early October. Uh, during that time or after this meeting, if we have a, a good support for the, the plan, the staff will start to put the bid documents together. So uh, that takes a few months to do. Uh, we would plan on a, a bidding the project in the springtime, uh, taking the contract approval to them, uh, to the, the council for approval in 2022, and then a uh, start construction sometime next summer is the plan. Uh, and construction is estimated to take about 120 days. So, so council would, would adopt the PIO, but they, at, at, a, at a further date, they would approve the project or excuse me, approve the contract uh, after the project documents were fleshed out. But, yes, but, but it wouldn't be coming. You know, back, but it wouldn't be coming back to the commission for review of, of the details of the implementation. Not in the current uh, schedule, it's not. Uh, but if the commission is uh, would like to have it come back again to uh, see details of uh, you know what the planting palette is or the. The restroom, the restroom has to go to the architectural review board to be reviewed as it's a piece of, or a structure. Uh, so there will be further comment on that. Um, but again, if, if there's other uh, details that the commission would like to see when the construction documents are put together, then we can make that yeah, happen. I, I, th I think that might be something for the commission to consider, even uh, perhaps creating an, an ad hoc next year to be reviewing a park, th this along with park amenities. And, and consider if, if it's worth, if there's an, a need to bring this to the full commission for review. Sure. Thanks. Um, so again, the park improvement uh, scope of work basically is the uh, basketball courts in the berm seating area, the uh, uh, prefabricated restroom, uh, the street improvements that we talked about with the heading parking stalls and the two accessible stalls. Um, we do have to do uh, maintain some drive access for the uh, the water district to access the creek, uh, so we'll be maintaining that. Uh, of course, street planting. We have the picnic area, the bocce ball court, the dog park, the open grass area, uh, the loop pathway that's composed of both asphalt and decomposed granite. Uh, both playgrounds, the one for older kids and younger kids. Uh, there is a, a new crosswalk that we will be putting on Fernando Ave, which is part of the Park Improvement Ordinance, uh, the incorporation, of course, of Ash Street into the overall park area, uh, the cul-de-sac for Chestnut, uh, of course, new site amenities through the whole park, so benches, tables, trash cans, all those things. Uh, of course, low flow irrigation and native planting. Uh, of course, going back into a drought, we want to be very cognizant of doing that. Uh, we also need to meet our new drainage requirements and filter the plant or the water coming off the park uh, before it goes into the creek. And of course, lighting and also new fencing around the residential areas, which is uh, slowly a, uh, a kind of melting away out there needs to be redone. So that's kind of the scope of work for uh, the park improvement boards itself. Uh, I'll leave the plan back up here. If anyone has any other questions, uh, if not, then a uh, chair, I'll throw it back to you. I have another another question. Um, the, all those uh, amenities like trash cans and, and drinking fountains and benches are perfect examples of um, 
yes. thing that we could fundraise for through uh, the uh, uh, Palo Alto uh, uh, Recreation, not Recreation Foundation, but the, the Friends of the Palo Alto Park. Right. And um, I'm wondering uh, how that, how we can do that. Um, um, so in other words, you've already, you're going to bid for the whole project, but uh, how, how can we um, get get them, um, the community to buy some of those things and um, reduce the uh, cost of the overall cost to the city? Um, I'm not sure if I can answer that right now. That's something that staff will have to meet to discuss. Uh, I would say that probably the, uh, the way to do it would be to advertise now before the actual project goes out to bid to try to secure some funding before so we know which amenities are being covered uh, and then which amenities need to be covered then by uh, purchase by the contractor. So uh, that is something that uh, staff can work on. We can get back to you how we can do that. Uh, I do know that we do have the park bench uh, program right now that we can start to use uh, as at least as a template for, you know, it could include other park amenities, of course, right now we have benches. So uh, that would be probably the easiest one to start with just by, you know, putting word out that there's so many amount of benches in this park that could take donations. So we can keep, we can go ahead with the PIO and we can go all the way through the process until we get to the part about bidding. So we have a, a month or two, if we could, you know, uh, see if we can get an advertisement. Um, uh, we don't have to wait. Right. I think that the project would go out to bid sometime probably February or March of next year. So we have those that timeline. Basically. Peter, do you anticipate there being a gap in what the funds that you have allocated and what it's going to cost? We requested funding for the full project, and that's what we were given. So right. at this point, we're fully funded. Now, of course, prices go mostly around here. They go up. So, yeah. we'll so see, uh, the, uh, right now, we are planning on doing the full part. So that was my question. If it's fully funded and we can get some donations, what happens to the money uh, that uh, from that fully funded uh, project, does it just go back into the um, into the general fund? Yes. So yes, at the end of the project, basically, if there's uh, funds that are left in the capital improvement uh, project, they are just basically put back into the capital improvement okay. funds to okay. use for the project. So. Um. All right. That's all I have. Okay, any other questions from any commissioners? I don't see anybody else's hand. Um, so- I, I have one very quick question, Peter. Um, this is Jeff Lemaire. Will the, uh, I, I assume the park will be closed for the entire three months of construction or is it something that, that is staged and there's certain parts that are open and other parts that are closed? I would say for this part, the, the full, the whole area will be enclosed. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And just again, great job on this plan and, and always love to see your work. Thank you. Yes. And there's no more community meetings that you need to have. Uh, I reached out to the Ventura community today, so there is uh, something that we might have to give them an update on what's happening. Uh, I think that because of the scale of the project that we would start uh, putting up signage in the park a lot earlier than we usually do for renovation projects. So I would say here pretty soon in the next couple of months that we'll start putting this plan up and uh, getting the word out that the idea is to basically do construction. So we'll, we'll definitely have a lot of outreach with the community about this for sure. That's good. Yeah. So to, to Jeff's comment about will it be closed for three months and all of that. That's cool. Um, Peter, could you put, if there are no other questions um, or comments, could you put the, you have a sample, the PIO up? Great. Yes. And um, if the commissioners don't have any questions on that, could we have a motion to 
Are we approving it or suggesting that the council approve it? Uh, Darren, do you want to? Yeah, it's uh, thanks, mm -hmm. Peter and Chair. It's rec the the Parks and Rec Commission would recommend that the council adopt the park improvement ordinance as specified in the attachment to the staff report. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. I'd like to move that the commission uh, recommend the park improvement ordinance to council for adoption. I'll second it. And Catherine, would you do a voice vote, please? Chair Cribs? Yes. Vice Chair Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner LaMare? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Five to approve the PIO for Bulware Park. That's great. Thank you all very much. Peter, this is really exciting because this has been, we've been hearing about this <laughs> for a long time and we, you were able to buy the additional property. It's very exciting. So great work on this to the staff and all of that. We're excited to see how it's coming along. And could we at some point request a tour? Oh, definitely. Yes. I will keep that in mind as we go along with the process. Uh, and I am going to sign off and I would just wanted to say one last thing that uh, hopefully here within the next uh, three or four weeks or five weeks, a, uh, we will be starting the renovation of Rinconada Park as well. So that's very exciting too. Uh, those are kind of the two biggest projects that we're working on Great. right now. Could I ask, is that Rinconada Park also fully funded? Uh, that is funded, yes. Okay. Good. Um, Chair, I, before uh, Peter leaves, um, I have a, uh, one more comment for Darren, and that is that that little corner of the AT&T property that wasn't included in the purchase, um, I would like to recommend that you go back to uh, real estate and legal and try to buy that. I was almost certain that we purchased that with the original uh, purchase and I'm really surprised that we didn't get that one little piece and so if if we could get that little piece now or in say two years uh, could we come back and increase the dog park or something like that or put parking a little bit of parking on uh, chestnut Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Moss. We'll, I can tell you we bought what was available for sale, and we could always ask AT&T if they are interested in selling more. Uh, I certainly think in the future, if, if they were willing to sell any of it, the more parkland, the better in there. Uh, so it makes sense to definitely mm -hmm. keep our eye on it, and I'm, I'm glad to talk to real estate to see if there's any openings for a conversation with AT&T. That'd be you. great, Darren. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you again, Peter. Um, Darren, could we move to the tentative agenda for August 24th? There were, when we talked last, there were, and Mandy, you're back. Good, thank you. Um, there were several things that were tentative, but not too much that was definite, if I remember. Yeah, thank you, Chair. We're in the same boat. A lot of things that are, are still tentative. For example, we've got the sidewalk vendor regulations, the ad hoc had mentioned, we're working on it, still have quite a bit, but we're really targeting September. Um, as the date. So I don't believe we can get that on the August one. The skate park, we mentioned we've got the meeting upcoming uh, with the stakeholders. I think that's a possibility for the mm -hmm. August uh, meeting, but not guaranteed. Um, that wouldn't be an action item, I don't think. I think it would be a discussion one. So I think the ad hoc can be discussing that soon, especially right after that meeting. I mentioned we have scheduled for August 3rd. Um, I had talked a little bit with the chair and vice chair, but the rest of the commission may not have heard about this one, an informational report from Valley Water on a purified water project. They have been looking at the former Los Altos sewage treatment plant, which is adjacent to the Baylands Preserve. And we talked to them um, about coming to the Parks and Rec Commission with an informational presentation. Um, and I reached out to them recently. They said tentatively for the September meeting, but they couldn't do August. Uh, the fire safety update was another one we talked about. Currently, no plans from the fire department or Office of Emergency Services to present to the Parks Commission, but they are, uh, again, I think I mentioned in the department report, they've got the community meeting on August 19th, 
and uh, council has asked fire department to present a study session on fire safety tentatively scheduled for September 20th. And then lastly, I think we talked about the memo to council on um, and VCAP regarding um, parkland. If I understood correctly, uh, Commissioner Rechtal talked about coming with perhaps a letter at the August meeting. Um, that one we could put on the agenda if that seems like something. And then lastly, we talked about recycled water line. Um, I have not connected both public works on that yet, but I think they can either give me a brief update to include in the department report, unless they've got something really substantial. We also have the Valley Water uh, Tide yeah. Gate. Yeah, the Tide Gate as well. So, so that, that seems pretty likely for August. Yeah, I think so. Yep. And, and are the people involved with the purified water report, info report from Valley Water, any of the same people that we're working with on the Tidegate project? They are not. Um, it'd probably be worth mentioning to the uh, purified water people that the Tidegate people will be presenting in case that is a reason for them to want to try to make the same pres the same meeting for a presentation if, if if, if that ended up being possible, it sounds like it's not, and maybe it's not that related, but I'm just throwing it out there. Sure. Darren, since the fire department isn't able to come to us, um, do you recommend that some of us go to that meeting at Palo Alto Hills Country Club and report, have some time on the agenda to report back to the commission? It seems like everybody, all the commissioners are really interested in fire safety, especially at Foothill Park and Arrastadera. I think it's a great idea, Chair. And I'd like it to be on Zoom because uh, I, don't, I'm, I don't understand how they can have a community meeting uh, O only uh, only uh, with people present um, and so if that's at all possible to get that message back to them I would really appreciate it. I'd David, be glad to check in with them on that. Thank uh, you. David are you talking about the um, the meeting at Palo Alto Hills? On yes. Sunday? Yes. I, okay thank you. Yeah that would make it easier but I, I think at the least, it would be good to have uh, something for us to understand and think yep. about. The last time we talked about fire safety was when the neighbors of Foothill Park came from um, Portola Valley mm -hmm. a couple years ago. So that would be good. So, uh, Darren, you're thinking we have enough to have a meeting. I do. I think the tide gate one is important and time sensitive. And between the, if we add the, the memo on the NV cap, um, I think that's worth having. Okay. And then maybe um, the ad hoc could get together and uh, do a quick outreach <clears throat> for advertising for funding and add that from what we learned tonight. For sure. Um, and, and skate park might make it as well, you said. I think it's possible, yes. Okay, good. good. And the, the Los Altos sewage treatment plant, um, that would be a separate, whole separate subject, or is that tied in with something else? No, it is tied with that water project that I just mentioned. Okay. Um, so they're looking at that side as potential location. Potential location for what? A, a, a water uh, purification okay. plant. Not to turn it into uh, baylands. Correct. Because I but know that would they... they'd be using all of it. They'd be using a portion of it for a plant. Oh. Okay. And, they... and they're just looking at the possibility at this stage. Okay. Because I know they paved over the entire piece of land they and they put a, a giant fence with barbed wire and this was only in the past eight months and the other thing is i thought it was going to be used for um, safe parking uh, but i guess that project uh, was moved to over near the athletic center and they're not going to use this at all for that purpose I haven't heard any conversations about using the LATP for safe parking right now, but I, I don't know. Safe parking did not have any water. I mean, the San Antonio does not have any water or sewage. So that made it hard to do the safe parking there. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Ku, do you have any additional information on that? No. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. 
Um, I do have a question, if I may. Um, does does the consideration for the water purification require an EIR? Uh, I believe so. It's a fairly significant um, build out that I saw and everything was really tentative. I've been only involved in one brief meeting. So I think a lot of the information that uh, they would come to present would be new to me too. Um, so I think we'll, we'd both be learning a little bit more when they came. And again, it was sort of very tentative and high level when they talked to me about it. Thank you. Okay, well, moving on to um, comments and announcements. Does anybody have either a comment or an announcement? And I will just kick it off by saying, I hope you're all enjoying the Olympic Games because <laughs> I certainly am. And I was certainly glad that Roger told us that Katie Ledecky had won her 1500, which is the first time women have ever swum that race in the entire Olympic Games. So good for her. So, so, sorry, spoiler I just, alert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just did one quick question back, back on the uh, the fire safety or the wildfire preparedness meeting. Is this just for Palo Alto or is this for other communities? I don't know that there's a limit on it. Uh, you saw the invite and I saw um, the same one. So no additional details. So as far as I'm concerned, I think we can invite whomever we would like. I think they were envisioning the surrounding foothills area as the core audience. Um, but so my question what is the is the outreach for the meeting uh, beyond Palo Alto to Los Altos Hills, uh, et cetera? I would assume it's largely being led by uh, the presenters, fire department and office of emergency services. But I know, for example, they intend on inviting mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District to help have a table there, for example. And I assume they'd be inviting their own constituents as well. There is a limit on the number of people in that building, as I understand it, to like a hundred yeah. some odd folks. So for what it's worth. And would there be an, a similar need for a Foothills Nature Preserve or Estero Preserve table? Yes, we are going to have an open space ranger there. Thank you. Sorry to back up. You, well, you're not because that was a comment and an announcement. So it fits. It's all right. Anybody else have anything? In that case, um, can uh, we move to adjourn, please? Someone? I move that we adjourn. Thank you, David. In a second. Uh, second. I think that's probably unanimous. So um, I hope you're all enjoying the rest of your summer. It's nice to see you all. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.